Hello and welcome to a deep dive. Great to be here. Today we're uh, digging into a stack of sources all about recent news updates really in HIV vaccine and treatment research. Yeah, specifically looking at what was hitting the headlines around May 2025. There's quite a bit here, some really hopeful developments, but also some ongoing challenges. These sources give us a great snapshot. That's right. We've got scientific breakthroughs, some trial results, and even the, uh, the wider picture, like funding and global efforts. So our mission is to pull out the most important insights for you. Let's do it. Okay, so let's unpack these sources. What jumps out, I think, across several of them is this clear theme, significant progress like actual tangible progress towards effective HIV vaccines. Yes, it feels like there's a real momentum. And what's really interesting, it pops up again and again in these sources, is the um, the core scientific approach that seems to be driving the optimism. Which is? It's this pathway involving developing broadly neutralizing antibodies, BNABs for short. Ah, BNABs. Right, I saw that term. These are like super antibodies. Essentially, yes. Yeah. They can neutralize lots of different HIV strains, which you know has always been a massive challenge for vaccine developers. And the sources are saying this isn't just like lab theory anymore. Exactly. They're indicating that trials are actually showing proof of concept for this whole BNAB strategy. I saw that phrase, proof of concept. Yeah. And also positive results from trials testing a germline targeting strategy. Yeah. That sounds specific. It is, and it's key. Uh, basically, the body doesn't easily make these BNABs on its own. So germline targeting is this, well, clever approach to guide the immune system. Mighty how? Step by step. Think of it like using a sequence of uh, carefully designed vaccine shots, like training wheels for your B cells. Those are the antibody factories. Okay. The aim is to coax them, to steer them down a very specific developmental path so they mature into making precisely the kind of antibodies that can become those powerful BNABs. Wow, that sounds incredibly precise. Wow. One okay, so let's start with um, those funding challenges. Yeah, it's uh, pretty striking, especially when you think about the impact on South Africa. Mm -hmm. It's been such a key place for HIV research for well, decades. Because of the high burden there and the expertise they've built up. Exactly. And our sources talk about how U.S. funding reductions, policy changes really, led to big cuts at the NIH. And that directly hit international grants. Hmm. And for our listeners in the labs, seeing these global shifts helps understand the bigger picture, right? We saw something like uh, nearly 800 NIH grants cut globally. That's a huge number. It really is. And specifically in South Africa, NIH research grants got suspended. What's really interesting, though, is how interconnected everything is. How oh, so? Well, for instance, a big USI consortium, like $46 million focused on early HIV vaccine discovery in Africa, mm -hmm. terminated. That's a major loss of infrastructure, you know? Wow. And it wasn't just the early stage stuff, was it? I think funding for a clinical trial in Soweto, looking yeah. at vaccines, that got paused, too. That's right. And that research unit, it was plugged into like four global HIV prevention and treatment networks. So the ripple effect was pretty wide. Right, hitting multiple areas at once. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Glenda Gray, who's a, you know, a major figure in HIV research, she described a really difficult situation. Uncertainty, even talk of research units potentially facing bankruptcy. That really shows how much they depended on that NIH support. Absolutely. So for those of us focused on testing, you know, we rely on that pipeline of new prevention and treatment tools. Mm -hmm. How did the South African government respond? That's a massive hole to fill financially. Well, the sources suggest they just don't really have the funds to replace what the NIH was providing. It's important to remember this NIH money was competitive. Mm. You know, it wasn't just aid. Right, based on merit. Exactly. But the scientists there, they've been really resourceful, yeah. working with their own medical research council, treasury, reaching out to places like the Gates Foundation, Wellcome Trust, trying to piece together other funding. Sounds like a real scramble to keep things going. It really highlights the fragility, doesn't it? Relying on international funding for such a critical global health issue. It does. And if you think about the implications for, you know, everyone listening, these funding issues create potential bottlenecks. The sources warn that less research capacity in South Africa could slow everything down. You mean like discovering new vaccine candidates, cure research, even refining prevention methods? Yeah, all of it. The whole knowledge generation process. South Africa offers so much the infrastructure, the um, unfortunate reality, the disease burden, providing context, the scientific expertise, the regulatory setup. Well, losing that contribution would be a huge blow globally. It really would. Though it's worth saying, South African scientists have shown incredible resilience before, you know, facing the epidemic itself, AIDS denialism. They're determined. 
Okay, well, let's shift gears a bit because there is some genuinely exciting news too. A major breakthrough with a treatment called linacapavir. For those guiding people through testing and care, this sounds like it could be a game changer. Oh, absolutely. Linacapavir is uh, really something else. It's the first long-acting HIV drug and injection just once every six months. Every six months. Wow. That's incredible compared to daily pills. Huge difference. Think about adherence, convenience, mm -hmm. both for treatment and potentially prevention. And it sounds like getting there was a real journey. Collaboration between basic science, pharma, and importantly, community advocates. Exactly. The sources trace it beautifully mm -hmm. from Wesley Sundquist's lab at the University of Utah doing fundamental work on the HIV capsid. The virus's protective shell, right? Right, to Gilead Sciences, the pharma company, developing the drug, and then Yvette Raphael bringing that crucial community voice. They actually won the Monty L. Balmick Breakthrough of the Year Award for it. That's fantastic. Now, for listeners maybe less familiar with the virology, why was focusing on the capsid protein different? Why did that work? Well, for a long time, most HIV drugs targeted enzymes, the tools the virus uses to copy itself. Sunquist looked at this structural part, the capsid. People thought it was maybe too stable to be a good target, but his lab found that even slightly mying with the capsid, really stops the virus from replicating effectively. It was sort of an unexpected vulnerability. A new weak spot to target. And that's where Gilead came in. Yep. They spent over a decade screening molecules, refining things, and eventually landed on lenacapavir. It has these properties that let it stick around and stay effective in the body for that full six months. Amazing. And initially, it was mainly seen as a treatment? Primarily, yes. But then came this key realization largely driven by Mopali Das at Gilead, about its huge potential for prevention pre-PM. Ah, okay. So that led to specific trials for prevention. Exactly. The Purpose 1 and Purpose 2 trials. And what's really important here, especially for everyone working with diverse communities, is how inclusive these trials were designed to be. How so? Purpose 1, focused on cisgender women and adolescent girls in sub-Saharan Africa groups, hit hard by HIV, but often underrepresented in trials. Purpose 2 included a diverse mix of cisgender men and gender-diverse people globally. Yeah, I remember reading that story about the young woman in Kigali powerfully arguing for including young people like her. That really sticks with you. It really does. And the results. Just incredible. Purpose 1 showed 100% efficacy. Zero infections in the Lena Kapavir group among those women and girls. 100%. That's unheard of. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. And Purpose 2 showed a 96% reduction in infections in that diverse global group. These are numbers that could genuinely change the trajectory of the epidemic. And the role of advocates like Yvette Raphael seems absolutely central here, making sure the community's needs were heard. Absolutely crucial. She brought that lived experience perspective, emphasized building trust, addressing why daily oral pre-EP can be challenging, especially for some women in Africa. Right, practical reality. <laughs> exactly. And she pushed hard for in including young people, pregnant women, to make sure if this gets approved, it's accessible to as many people who need it as possible. And Purpose One was even stopped early because it was so effective. That's right. Which means it can potentially become available sooner. It's just a fantastic example of how decades of science, pharma development, and community advocacy can come together. Truly remarkable. Okay, so from that major treatment and prevention news, let's look at vaccines. There's progress there too, focusing on something called germline targeting. What's that about? Yeah, germline targeting is a really sophisticated strategy. The goal is to coax the immune system into making what are called broadly neutralizing antibodies, or BNABs. Okay, and why are those so important for an HIV vaccine? Because HIV mutates so incredibly fast. Traditional vaccines often struggle with that. BNABs are special because they can recognize and neutralize many, many different strains of HIV by targeting parts of the virus that don't change much. The conserved regions. Exactly. Finding a way to reliably get the body to make those has been a huge goal in HIV vaccine research. And there have been some early positive signs from clinical trials using this approach. Yes. Promising initial results. Hmm. Two phase one trials, IAVI G002 in North America, and G003 in Africa, South Africa and Rwanda. They involved almost 80 people and used an mRNA platform like some of the COVID vaccines. Okay, and G002 used a stepwise or heterologous boosting approach. Can you break that down? Sure. Think of it like training the immune system in steps. The first shot, the prime, shows the immune system a basic version of the target on HIV. Then a later, different shot, the boost, helps refine that response 
pushing it towards making those more powerful, broadly neutralizing antibodies. Kind of guiding the immune response. Precisely. And in GRO002, this prime booth strategy did manage to advance the immune response, generating what are called VRCO1 class antibodies. These are early defenders that have some BNAB-like features. Some participants even had what they called elite responses. Very encouraging. And the G003 trial in Africa, what was the focus there? G003 looked mainly at that first priming step in African participants, and it showed the vaccine successfully activated the right kind of immune cells. Ah, so confirming the first step works in that population too. Right, which is really important because it suggests this whole approach might actually work globally in the populations that need it most. So together, these trials provide that crucial proof of concept in humans, building on earlier work, I assume. Definitely. This builds on an earlier trial, IAVI G001, and lots of lab work that helped figure out this stepwise strategy. It shows how science builds piece by piece. And it's great news that the immune responses looked pretty similar across the North American and African groups. That really boosts hope for a global vaccine. What about safety? Generally well tolerated, which is key in phase one. There were some skin reactions at the injection site in some G002 participants, which they're looking into more closely, planning follow-up studies, maybe with lower doses. But overall, the initial safety looks pretty good. Okay. Now, there was also some more fundamental research mentioned from Scripps, looking at how these BNABs recognize lipids, fats on the virus surface. How does that fit in? Yeah, that's fascinating. It's digging really deep into how these antibodies actually grab onto the virus. Using computer models, they've figured out specific parts of the antibodies that are key for latching onto these lipids on the HIV membrane. And what's the significance of that? Well, one cool finding was that as the antibodies mature, they actually get better at binding these lipids, but without accidentally attacking the body's own cells, avoiding autoimmunity. Mm. Understanding that complex interaction, how they target both protein and lipid parts. Could help design better vaccines. Exactly. Vaccines that maybe train the immune system to target both components. It might even have spin-offs for understanding autoimmune diseases or engineering better antibodies for other therapies. It's really intricate stuff. It really brings us full circle, doesn't it? Back to the funding issue. Because this kind of deep basic science, like the capsid work that led to Lena Kapavir or this lipid interaction research, it's absolutely essential for future breakthroughs. Absolutely. The sources really hammer this home. Cutting funding doesn't just affect today's projects. It impacts the entire pipeline. Discovery, development, trials, distribution. It's all connected. And things like PEPFAR's authorization expiring soon? That raises real concerns about getting treatments like Lena Kapavir out to developing countries where they're desperately needed. Big concerns. It underscores why sustained, predictable funding across the board is just so critical for making real progress against HIV. So wrapping up this deep dive, what are the main things you think our listeners, especially those in the testing network, should take away? Okay, well first, definitely the funding challenges are real, particularly for crucial research hubs like South Africa. And that's something we need to watch as it could slow things down. Right, the vulnerability. Second, Lana Kapavir is a genuinely massive step forward for treatment and prevention a real testament to collaboration. Hopeful news there. And third, the vaccine research, while still early stage, is showing real promise with these new germline targeting strategies. There's definite momentum. And it's crystal clear how linked everything is funding, treatment, prevention. You can't really separate them in the fight against HIV. Not at all. Progress in one area relies on support and progress in the others. So while there's been amazing progress, the message is clear. Continued support for research and ensuring everyone can actually access these innovations is still absolutely vital. Couldn't agree more. If we really want to make a lasting dent in the pandemic, we need both the science and the equitable access. A really important point. It connects the science directly back to the vital work happening every day in testing labs and communities. Thanks so much for unpacking all of that today. My pleasure. Always important to track these developments.